The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Good evening and warm welcome to all Citrix professionals here. I'm sure uh, most of us are associated with uh, Citrix as a consultant, uh, system engineer, uh, uh, or an user, or even a trainer, and few are students. So I welcome uh, each and every uh, uh, Citrix professional uh, to uh, Citrix uh, Cloud Focus webinar. So my name is Kiran Rajput. I have been uh, associated with the IT training industry for the last 18 years. With Citrix, I am there for the last two years. And I manage uh, Citrix education business in India and subcontinent. So uh, I would also like to this one that welcome people here okay, who aspire to be a Citrix professional. I understand there are a few people, they don't have Citrix ba background, but they uh, enrolled uh, in this session, so they are aspiring to be uh, a Citrix professional. So let me quickly introduce uh, uh, the uh, presenters today. Okay, so we have Mr. Jeff Ashley. So he has 15 years of uh, work experience in Citrix technology. So he is an architecture consultant, okay, a trainer, and last but not the least, he is an enabler. So today we also have Parvin Kumar. So who is a consultant, advisor, and a trainer. And the good part of, of Parvin Kumar is uh, he trains around, he trains and impact around uh, thousands of Citrix professional every year. Okay, so once again, welcome you all. So now I request uh, uh, Jeff Ashley to take it over uh, from me. Jeff Ashley, over to you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm so glad that you're here with us today. And I noticed that in the question log, we had a question about is this uh, webinar on Citrix or is it on Azure? And in fact, it's on both. Um, talking about uh, using the Citrix cloud to manage your environment and then making sure that you understand that Microsoft Azure could be one of your processing platforms. We call that a resource layer. Anyway, welcome to the webinar, and I'm glad you're here. Let's get uh, into the content real quick here. So the topics that we're going to cover today are Citrix virtual apps and desktop deployment models, how to master image in Azure, how to prepare that master image in Azure, how to use machine creation services in the Azure environment, and then considerations for deploying VDAs or the uh, processing space, whether it's uh, published apps and desktops or it's desktops uh, themselves, considerations for deploying those in Azure. Now, I have to uh, take just a moment and uh, recognize the fact that the scope of this webinar is pretty broad. We're going to cover in one hour what uh, typically is covered in one week of training. And so that means this is an executive briefing format because of the time allocated for this webinar. Uh, there are many, many more topics that are covered in depth with reinforcements via uh, hands-on labs and instructor-led lectures along with colleague interactions in the Citrix uh, classes that are available. And I think that uh, Kieran is going to explain a little bit more later about the education offerings that are available. But this webinar is designed to introduce you to the concepts at an executive briefing level. Okay, so Citrix education is the best preparation for migrating your production environment into the cloud. Okay. Couple questions that come right at the beginning is what is IAAS or PAAS or SAAS or SAS? Pass 
or the IAAS. We know pretty much what each one of these are. SaaS, Software as a Service, allows users to connect to and use cloud-based applications over the internet. Common examples are email, calendaring, office tools such as Microsoft Office 365. SaaS provides a complete software solution that you can purchase on a pay-as-you-go basis from a cloud service provider. You rent the use of the application for your organization and your users connect to it over the internet. The second one is PAUSE, Platform as a Service. Now, Platform as a Service is a complete development and deployment environment in the cloud with resources that enable you to deliver everything from simple cloud-based applications to, to sophisticated cloud-enabled enterprise applications. Like IIS or IAS, PAUSE includes infrastructure, servers, storage, networking, but also middleware, development tools, business intelligence, database management, and more. Pause is designed to support the complete web application lifecycle, building, testing, deploying, managing, and updating that environment. Typically, it's used for web application or web deployments. The last one, Infrastructure as a Service, IAAS. This is an instant computing infrastructure provisioned and managed over the internet, allowing you to quickly scale up and, square, and scale down with demand. And you pay for only what you use. II or IAAS helps you to avoid the expense and complexity of buying and managing your own physical servers and, and using other data center infrastructure supplied by the vendor. Each resource is offered, offered as a separate service component, and you only need to rent or a, uh, engage a particular uh, component for as long as you need it. The cloud computing service provides management infrastructure while you purchase, install, and configure and manage your own software running on their hardware. Operating systems, middleware, and applications all work together. So that's real briefly what the three different service providers are categorized as. Now, moving into the Citrix Cloud, what is the Citrix Cloud? Well, it is a platform as a service that hosts and manages administers Citrix services. It connects to your resources via a Citrix cloud connector on any cloud infrastructure that you choose. It allows you to create, manage, and deploy workspaces with applications and data to your end users from a single console. Now, the Citrix cloud hosts and operates the platform and services that are used to manage your environment. You, the customer, still host and operate your applications, your data, your networks, and your virtual machines. We call those the VDAs, the machines that we have placed the virtual delivery agent upon. Now, Citrix Cloud has a lot of different services. Some of the services that you see li listed here, you've got the Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Service, Endpoint Management Service, Secure Browser Service, Content Collaboration, Gateway Services. There's a lot of different services. So what I'd like to do is let's just log in to the Citrix Cloud. It's real easy, cloud.citrix.com. You go there and you log in. There we go. Once you log into the Citrix Cloud, you'll get a list of all of the services that are available for you. And here's the initial dashboard of the Citrix Cloud. 
notice that the services you've got smart tools 14 other services access control analytics all the way down to WIM workspace environment management these are all services that can be subscribed and applied we're going to be talking about the virtual apps and desktop right here in the, the lower um, uh, section virtual apps and desktops we also have lab services now the lab services Citrix lab services allows us to take a look at bring that back up there we go the lab services allows us to bring in new and uh, new technologies new functionality it gives you the opportunity to try it um, so what's happening right now because it is a very dynamic environment and always growing you've got session manager is a new lab service this allows you to to set up pre-launch and anonymous apps for faster access for kiosk mode so those are the services that are available in the citrix uh, cloud environment now remember the cloud environment is a management layer and i'll explain all of that real quickly here so going back to our slide deck that's what Citrix Cloud Services is. Whereas Microsoft Azure, and this discussion right here could be Microsoft Azure, uh, Google Space, AWS, those are all public cloud hosting environments. It is a leading IaaS vendor. Now, this slide deck is about three months old. And it, at that time, there were 36 data centers and, and four additional regions are being planned. Framework could be uh, that it supports both on-prem and cloud deployments, comprehensive uh, compliance with Azure government, trusted by 90% and on and on and on. Well, I went out and looked at the website, the Azure website. Let me bring that up real quick. Here's the Azure website. And in just a few months, those numbers have changed. And take a look at it in the middle. It's now 54 regions and over 95% of the companies, Fortune 500 companies, now use Azure as their processing platform. So we need to update the slide. There we go. Data centers in 54 regions now. 95 trusted by 95 percent of the fortune 500 companies and it does support a broad selection of operating systems programming languages frameworks databases devices it's a powerful add-on to the citrix cloud for hosting resources now what that means is that the citrix cloud can assist and manage if you choose to place your processing space, your uh, desktops, your published applications on Azure. Now we'll talk a moment in a moment about the different types of deployments. Okay, so let's talk for just a moment and get some background into the architectural overview of Citrix virtual apps and desktops. And we're going to do this in the layered approach. Now, in the layered approach, you can see here, uh, you've got the user layer, the access layer, the control layer, resource layer, and the hardware layer. And these architectural components are mapped to their functions. So we need to talk about their functions and what happens. So I'm going to go through all of the different layers real briefly and explain what they do. And then when we get to the Citrix cloud, what components can be moved from on-premise or from your uh, Citrix uh, deployment on Azure or AWS into the Citrix cloud. Let me get into that. So let's define the architectural layers. Let's talk about the user layer. The user layer is all about the endpoint device, where they are, whether they're internal or external, what operating system is being used on that endpoint. The current client software is the Citrix workspace app. And in the user layer, deployment or installation along with updates to the client software must be considered and planned for. So that's the user layer. They can be internal, they could be external. If they're 
external, they typically have to come through a firewall in order to gain access to what has been uh, uh, configured for that, that end user. The next layer is the access layer. Now, the access layer covers all Citrix infrastructure components that are providing access and authentication, security, and orchestration of the published resources. So the access layer is where the technical components lie that serve as middlemen between the end user and their endpoints and the published resources provided by the production Citrix virtual apps and desktop site. Typical deployment requires external users to make a secure encrypted connection using SSL to a Citrix gateway. The storefront server could be in the DMZ, it could be on-prem, or it could be in the Citrix cloud. But that's the access layer. Moving on, from the access layer, we have the control layer. Now, the control layer has delivery controllers and domain controllers, SQL Server, licensing server, so on and so on. The components within the control layer determine the flexibility and scalability of your deployment. Now, the control layer is used to group and, and it understands the core components of the Citrix virtual apps and desktops implementation. The components in this layer include the delivery controller, as I said a moment ago, the domain controllers for AAA, database server, license server. The, de the delivery controller is the central broker that handles all requests for all sessions. And this includes both apps and desktops across server OS and desktop OS hosts. The controller also manages the provisioning and maintenance of the published applications and resources. The delivery controller saves all of its configurations and its log files in the site database. The delivery controller also performs load balancing of user requests for applications and desktops. The Citrix virtual apps and desktops deployment relies on a SQL platform to host the site database. The Citrix licensing server centrally manages and disperses licenses for connections. So it's important to understand what's in the control layer because it's the control layer and all of the components that we have to manage there, that's what we can move up into the Citrix cloud. The next is the resource layer. Now the resource layer describes and encompasses all of the resources that authorized users can gain access to. Resources such as applications, desktops, user data, profiles, documents, resource layer is also the architectural orientation of where the Citrix administrator considers how to best deploy, manage, and control these resources. So that's what we deliver to the end user. Those resources can be on a server operating system or a desktop operating system. It can be on Windows or, or uh, Linux. Um, we can have assigned desktop OSs, remote PC, uh, remote access to physical hardware. All of that is considered part of the resource layer. And then the last one is the hardware layer. Now, the hardware layer is also addressed as the compute layer. The hardware or compute layer can be abstracted by using a cloud-based resource such as Amazon, Azure, or Google, or on-prem. Okay? Very good. So that's the hardware layer. Now... The hardware layer, as we see here, provides the virtual computing needed to access, control, and deploy the resource layers that we talked about before. It's no accident that the hardware layer is presented beneath those other layers. 
The components that are found in the hardware or compute layer are network infrastructure, our network being copper, fiber, or wireless, storage processors, RAM, memory, GPU, accelerators, and of course your choice of physical machines that your resources are loaded on. These machines, again, can be a, uh, machines that you rent in a hosted environment or on-prem. So that's the architectural overview, the Citrix virtual apps and desktops by layer. And uh, what we did was we mapped the components to their functions. And now we are going to look at deploying some of those on and via the Citrix uh, cloud. And we're going to look at deploying what type of models can you use to deploy your Citrix environment on Microsoft Azure. The first one, the first model, is a complete move or forklift. Uh, a forklift approach constitutes moving your entire Citrix stack from on-prem into Azure. You're going to move all of your virtual machines. You're going to move all of your processing space. You also will move all of your um, account management, um, SQL Server, uh, your Active Directory, everything will be moved up into the cloud. That's called a forklift or complete move. Now, using this approach, you'll deploy and maintain your own delivery controllers and will not be using Citrix Cloud. If you're not using the Citrix Cloud, you don't need the Citrix Cloud connectors. You need to ensure that your design includes high availability on all the components. By moving the full stack to Azure, you'll also need to host and maintain the SQL Server database in Azure, which might lead to higher costs compared to, uh, say, on-prem or the Citrix cloud deployment for your SQL database. And so a complete move means I take everything that's on-prem and I move it to the cloud. And that's one valid method. That is a model of deployment. The next model is an, an extend environment. So the extended approach involves creating a new zone in your on-prem Citrix virtual apps and desktops infrastructure. This new zone will be in Azure. And then you can deploy additional delivery controllers, optionally storefront and Citrix gateway in Azure. After getting the infrastructure in place, you can then use the Azure plugin to deploy machine creation service catalogs to Azure, Azure directly. And you can do that from Studio. Much like the forklift method, you're deploying the on-premise pro product directly into the cloud. You're just extending what you have on-prem into the cloud. Now, because uh, you're ma still managing everything, you're managing the delivery controllers, you're managing the database, you're managing Active Directory, you don't need Citrix Cloud connectors because you're not using the Citrix Cloud. You're putting your environment and extending it into the cloud. So the two modes or models that we've talked about is a forklift mode where we move everything into the cloud or we extend into the cloud to give us additional resources, okay? So that's the extend mode. Some organizations look at the cloud, like Microsoft Azure, as a kind of a disaster recovery data center. So it's almost the same design as the forklift load, but we primarily process on-prem or locally. Then we use Azure as a failover environment. So using Azure as the data center or data recovery data center, it's almost the same design as I said, except we can deallocate the resources while they're not being used. Now, deallocation of the resources means that we will only be paying for storage in Azure while the virtual machines are not running. We need to ensure 
uh, that we have a process in place for spinning up the disaster zone and making sure that that process is tested in case we have to fail over to the cloud instance. Large number of VMs, though, may take quite a bit of time to spin up in Azure than more time than what would be required on an on-prem. So it is a good plan, but consider automating uh, the startup process when there is a uh, event uh, that causes a disaster recovery uh, to take place. And so that's another model. So the three models that we've talked about so far is a forklift upgrade to the cloud. The second one is extending my environment. I'm growing. I don't have enough resources on-prem. I can extend my environment by leveraging Azure or AWS. The third model that we've talked about here is the disaster recovery model. The fourth one that we're going to talk about is a deployment model on Microsoft Azure using Citrix virtual apps and desktops essentials. In other words, we go to the Citrix uh, or to the Azure marketplace and we subscribe into the desktop essentials. It's a simple service that allows you to deliver Windows applications from Microsoft Azure to any user on any device. The service combines the industry-leading Citrix virtual apps and desktop service with the power and flexibility of Microsoft Azure. The service is recommended by Microsoft as the replacement for Azure Remote App. The Essentials service is designed specifically for the Azure Marketplace. So you would go to the Azure Marketplace and subscribe to Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktops Essentials. And that would give you that experience. The partnership gives you a single interface to deliver a complete Windows 10 digital workspace from Azure. That's another deployment methodology. Or you can deploy using Microsoft Azure and Citrix Cloud. Now, Citrix Cloud with Azure Resource Location, Citrix hosts the control plane. Now, you remember we talked a moment ago about the control layer. The control layer has the delivery controllers. The control layer has your licensing. It has your SQL database. Citrix manages all of those. Now, the Citrix Cloud with Azure is the resource location and the primary focus of the CXD 251 course and the CXD 252 course. It combines both Citrix Cloud and Azure. It manages on-prem resources and cloud-based resources. All of the brokering is done within the Citrix Cloud. Citrix deploys, maintains, and updates the control plane. And we utilize the Azure plugin to deploy machine catalogs into Azure, leveraging the Azure API to deploy VDAs. We copy disks, we power manage, we deallocate the VDAs when they're no longer needed. Additionally, the VDAs being placed in Azure, we, can, um, we need the cloud connectors and Active Directory deployed in Azure as a minimum. Optionally, we can deploy the storefront and the Citrix Gateway in Azure or use the storefront and Citrix Gateway as a service from the Citrix Cloud. Well, we've been on, in this webinar for about a half an hour. So what I'd like to do is, is pause for a minute and take a look at some of the questions. In fact, Kieran, can yeah, you uh, moderate yes, that? Jeff, well, yeah, I'm going to moderate it. Uh, okay, so let me start with uh, a few important questions. Okay, so the first one is, uh, could you tell us about the features of monitoring and uh, alerting? Um, found within the cloud, the Citrix cloud? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is a huge, huge question. Um, yes, there is There is a ton of monitoring. I just put a, a uh, the website back up. You've got resource locations, that's where you're processing. But then you've got notifications, you can look at your tickets. But if, as you scroll down, one of the 
items is an analytics. Um, analytics means that I can apply machine learning and artificial intelligence to my environment. In other words, I can uh, set up monitoring. Um, I can set up trending, um, even granular. So let's say that we had a, a an employee by the name of John. And that employee, he logs in every Monday morning at 8 o'clock, and he logs out at 5 o'clock. And he works only Monday through Friday. And he's been doing that for years. The analytics would build a profile for him. What is normal for him to do, for John to do? So on Saturday, somebody logs in as John on Saturday. And the analytics will say, whoa, wait a minute. That's not his normal work. And it's that analytics and that artificial intelligence. And at that point, you can say, notify security or notify his manager or send an email to John. Did you just log in? And if it's a no, then we can capture that session and block it. Um, there's a lot of different um, reporting features. There is um, up here, you can go to uh, what's new. You can go to your notifications, um, feedback, trouble tickets, uh, log files. Um, yeah, when you manage using the Citrix Cloud, you have a lot of different management and uh, reporting functionality uh, that allows you to look at all of your deployments, whether they're on-prem, multi-cloud. You may have some objects uh, that are SaaS um, supported by third-party vendors. You may have applications that are on Azure, applications that are on Google, application. Anyway, the multi-cloud hybrid environment can be fully managed with the Citrix cloud, and it would do the analytics, it would do the reporting, it would capture all the log files. Um, it is a tremendous platform that allows an engineer to um, really understand what's going on in their environment. Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, you bet. So PVS, yeah, next question, PVS comes on which layer? Say that again, please. Uh, PVS comes on which layer? Ah, PVS. Very good. Um, provisioning services and machine creation services are, they, they have the same functionality, but different methodology, how they carry it out. Okay? And so machine creation services is in the control layer. We can go in and... and I'm going to be talking about that in the next half an hour about how machine creation services. So the PVS provisioning services is at the exact same layer, exact same layer as machine creation services. That's in the control layer. Um, last year, PVS was not supported in Citrix Cloud. Now it is. And so we can use PVS. Now, PVS is a is a server-based management, whereas uh, machine creation services is a hypervisor-based uh, service for deploying your virtual machines. So yes, it's in the control layer. Thank you. So uh, Scott is asking, we are in the process of migrating to Citrix Cloud. Is uh, Gmalto two-factor authentication supported as we have been told Citrix Cloud does not support Gmalto Cloud. Okay, uh, let's see notifications. If you go here to notifications, oh, I've already read them. <laughs> I read it this morning. Um, Citrix Cloud does support two-factor authentication. It's it's one of the brand new features that are coming out. That is out right now. Um, you, I, I would do more research uh, with Citrix Cloud and find out if specifically your deployment um, of two-factor is authorized or, or 
um, supported right now. Uh, Citrix is adding more and more security all the time. And uh, there were announcements uh, just last couple of days about a new two-factor authentication that is being supported. <laughs> so I would uh, I would talk with a Citrix consultant specifically about your requirements in two-factor authentication. Okay. Wonderful. So is it complicated process to move entire setup in forklift model? Uh, yes. <laughs> if you go with the forklift model, remember you're doing it. You have to go in, you have to set up, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those considerations. You have to set up the networks, you have to set up the storage. Um, a lot of times you have to script items. Now, you can go to the Azure Marketplace and get most of your components there, but once once they're stood up in the environment, you have to add storage, you have to add uh, networks, you have to add your own software, your own licensing. Um, it, it can be quite complex, uh, but there are a number of organizations that do just that. They do not want to host on-prem. They want the cloud to manage the hardware. You manage everything that sits on the hardware in a forklift upload. Yeah, great, Jeff. Uh, we will take a couple of questions. Okay, can we go for Citrix Cloud and instead of uh, using Netscalar Gateway as a service, can we use our on-prem Netscalar, on-premises Netscalar? Yes, you can. Um, you have it available in your subscription in the cloud, but you can also use it on uh, on-prem um, and manage your environment using that device locally. Um, what we do is we set up cloud connectors, and the cloud connector allows communication from your processing space, whether it's in the cloud in Azure or AWS or Google Space or on-prem, and it allows it to communicate with possibly the storefront that is in the cloud or with the delivery controllers that are in the cloud. Now, Storefront has been renamed. It's going to be the workspace uh, service, okay? In either case, you can put the uh, Citrix Gateway, which was called the NetScaler Gateway, on-prem or in the cloud. That's up to you. Okay. How can I know about the, uh, all the policies with their explanation available in Citrix Cloud? Any uh, URL uh, which explains Citrix policies? Oh, let's see. Um, there, yeah, there's quite a bit of information about the Citrix policies. Um, <laughs> the component that you're looking at is the workspace environment management. Uh, all I did is I logged into the Citrix cloud. You can create an account real quick. It takes less than a minute to create an account. You don't have to subscribe to anything. You can go in here, you can request a demo for workspace environment, uh, you can learn more, or you can just uh, Google WIM or workspace environment management and get quite a bit more information about that. Now, the policies that are available are huge. You've got lots and lots of policies. You've got policies that manage the endpoint. You've got policies that manage uh, mapped resources like mapped printers, mapped storage. Uh, WIM is where you're going to go and take a look at all the things that can be managed. Okay? So that's the workspace environment management. I would take a look at that. I would Google that and uh, get all the information on your policies, your profile management, and so on. Okay? Great. Uh, Jeff, last question for now. Okay. If control layer in Citrix Cloud, uh, what is Citrix responsibilities? So, uh, what is Citrix responsibilities? Uh, no, this question uh, it's not very uh, clear. I think I can understand that. Um, yeah. If you leverage, if you use Citrix Cloud, <laughs> like we've got, like, like here, Citrix is responsible for the scalability. In other words, if you have 10 users and all of a sudden you have 1,000 users, Citrix will scale up the delivery controller, the SQL database, all of that, okay? 
they are responsible for all of the components in the control layer. Okay? They manage the licenses. You don't have to buy a license for SQL Server. You don't have to buy a license for, uh, for the uh, Windows Server that the delivery controllers run on. Citrix maintains the licenses. They maintain all of the patches. They maintain the scalability. They maintain the high availability. They maintain all of that. What you do is you subscribe. You don't have to buy a Citrix license as you did in the past. One license per user. No, you subscribe, tell it how many users, and immediately Citrix picks up all the rest. What you are responsible for in the Citrix environment is your processing space, either on-prem or in the cloud, okay? So that's what Citrix is responsible for in the cloud. Any questions? Yeah, uh, Jeff, thanks. Uh, th there are a lot of questions uh, flowing in. So what we'll do, maybe uh, after the webinar, we will take rest of the question. I just request you to this one continue with uh, uh, the uh, rest of the webinar. You bet. Thanks, Kieran. Okay, let's move on. How do you master an image so that it can be delivered in Azure. Now, there's a number of ways to do that. The first way is physically. So you've got ARM, Azure Resource Manager. It enables you to work with resources in your solution as a group. You can deploy, update, delete resources in your solution. Uh, you can use a template for deployment. That template can work for different environments such as testing, staging, and even production. Resource Manager provides um, security, auditing, and tagging features to help you manage the environment once you've deployed it. The benefits of uh, ARM, or Azure Resource Manager, you can deploy, manage, and monitor all the resources. You can manage your infrastructure through templates rather than scripts. You can define dependencies between resources so that they can be deployed in the correct order. You can apply access control to all services in your re resource group because uh, RBAC or role-based access control is natively integrated into the management platform. You can apply tags to resources to logically organize all the resources in your subscription. You can Clarify your organization's billing by viewing costs for a group of resources that share the same tag. So you can uh, detail billing via tags. Now, the tasks that are required for deploying in Azure are this. One, you have to create a resource group in Azure. So you log in, you get your, uh, uh, your first account set up, then you create a resource group. Then you create a virtual network in Azure so that your machines that you stand up have management and access. So you have to first, number one, create a resource group. Number two, create a virtual network in Azure. Now that virtual network is how we manage that environment, how the machines talk to one another. Third, if you're going to have users get to those machines, you have to create a peer network. So let's say you're building a web server. You had to create a resource group in Azure, get permissions, add the web server, give it an internal network so that management can interact with that web server, and then give it a peer network, which gives the access to the outside world. Then you have to create a storage account. A storage account is where that machine's storage will reside. Then you, com you create a compute resource with the virtual machines, and you can do that from scratch from uh, the resource manager as your resource manager, or Citrix Cloud can leverage the machine creation services and create a virtual machine in that environment. Okay, so again, before you put the machine in the environment, you have to create a resource group, you have to create your networks, both internal and external. You have to have storage in order to put the virtual machine in. Then you create your compute environment. Okay, Azure security extensions. 
security extensions can be used to protect these machines that you put into Azure. Microsoft Anti-Malware for Azure is a free real-time protection. Its capability is that it helps identify and remove viruses, spyware, and other malicious software with configurable alerts when known malicious or unwanted software attempts uh, to install itself or run in your Azure system. And so what you would want to do is when you create the machine, you would want to select your security extensions. And you can select those. Uh, Microsoft Anti-Malware is free. You can select Semantic Endpoint Protection, Trend Micro, Deep Security. Those are on a subscription basis. Other vendors, as I said a moment ago, provide extensions. And uh, that's what you would set up in the, uh, in the Azure environment if you're doing a forklift upload or an extend your environment, any of those. Okay. So how to use machine creation services. Now, we had a question a moment ago about PVS, provisioning services. Now, there's not enough time in this webinar. Remember, we said it was an executive briefing. We're doing, we're covering the content rather quickly. Um, I really like provisioning services. I like machine creation services. Both are quality methods for deploying your workspaces or your VDAs into either on-prem or in the cloud. Um, because of the time, I can't really go over provisioning services, but it applies equally to machine creation services. So we're, what we're going to do here is we're just going to look at the machine creation services and how it fits in, say, a deployment in Azure. How it works on-prem with your own hypervisors. Uh, you create a virtual machine on your own hypervisor. Then you go into Studio, which is the management console for your delivery controller or your delivery, uh, yeah, the delivery controller. Then you snapshot that virtual machine. So you created a virtual machine in your hypervisor. You snapshot the machine. Then we make a full copy of that snapshot. And that copy is put in a SR, or storage repository, that your hypervisor utilizes. Okay, this is on-prem. Then what we do is we attach an instructional disk to that. So a temporary virtual machine is created from the snapshot copy, and it runs the process of depersonalization. You might know that as like... Um, uh, where we remove the SID, uh, new SID, or something along those lines. But it, what it does is it, it it takes the personality out of the disk, and it creates the disk image uh, in a neutral fashion so that we can assign a identity to that disk a little bit later. So step four creates the preparation VM. Step five attaches the virtual uh, disk preparation in order to depersonalize the virtual machine. Step six, powers on the preparation. Step seven, begins the image preparation process. And we prepare the image. Then step eight, we the preparation VM updates the snapshot, the preparation VM updates the copy of the snapshot, and it shuts it down. Now, when that's completed, that image now is ready to deploy. So what we do is we make copies of that image, and when we make copies of that image, we create identity disks. Now, we generate the new, like we would in a new SID, we generate that, but that, that new identity is put in a very small disk that at runtime we merge together with the prepared uh, snapshot so that I can have 50, 100, 200, 500 machines running all off of that snapshot with their own individual identity. And so we've got that identity disk, and then we have the differencing disk. Now, because 
they all have the common snapshot. That snapshot is read only. Any edits, additions, any runtime area, that's in the differencing disk. And what we do is we leverage the hypervisor or the cloud, Azure Cloud, to merge those disks together and to produce the virtual machine very quickly. It basically copies the um, snapshot of the master image and makes it available in multiple uh, objects, all with their own separate identity. Okay. So how does machine creation services work in Azure? I just described how it works on-prem. Now let's understand how it works in Azure. You create your master machine. The master VHD is created in a storage account. So what we do is we stand up a machine in Azure. We add all of the software, add all of the printers, add all the anything that we need on that device as a master machine. And it's in a master storage account. The next step is we run the machine creation services wizard in the cloud. We check the availability of resources with the Azure API. In other words, Citrix Cloud works directly with Azure. It looks for that virtual machine. It recognizes how many cores does that virtual machine need, what type of NICs, what type of storage. Citrix ARM plugin grabs all of that information. It checks for the available resources. Have they been allocated? You say you want 500 machines, but you've not, you've not allocated that much resources. It will assist you in scaling the Azure deployment to manage the amount of resources that you're asking for. The next step is that we create a resource group. Remember we said earlier that you have to create a resource group, then you have to create storage and networks and all of that. So we create a resource group. So network security group is created, the NSG. The storage accounts are created that will be needed for the number of machines that we're going to deploy. And the storage accounts, additional storage accounts are created based on how many you need. So the security group is created to isolate the prep VM from the rest of the network. This blocks any inbound or outbound traffic so that the prep VM during its normal life cycle of creating. And then a new, a new resource group will be created for every 240 virtual machines that you create. So let's say you have 500, it's going to create two production resource groups automatically for you. Okay. Now, storage accounts are, can, can be created. Storage accounts um, can be standard, premium, managed. We can create network security groups. All of that can be done as part of the, my, uh, the machine creation services. Then we validate the connections. Next step, validate the service principle connectivity. Make sure that the service principle has access to the Azure resources. We consolidate the image and prepare for copy. This means that the uh, uh, we prepare the master image snapshot from the master image virtual machine for other hypervisors. But for Azure perspective, we don't need to perform any snapshot or image because it is necessary to implement this method to use machine creation APIs. So we've got all of that going on. The master image is copied to the first storage account defined for the catalog. The next steps, we identify the disk preparation virtual machine. It's created. The preparation takes place and then it's stopped and we create an identity disk for that new creation. Then we attach that identity disk. Now we have a base image and we replicate it. We validate the connection settings, consolidate the master image, 
and move forward. Then we have a pre-flight check. All created resources are checked before the virtual machine creation process is begun. So we've got our base image, we've got our identity space, we've got everything in readiness. We then do a health check. And at that point, the identity disks are created for the number of resources that you have asked for. The virtual machines are created and linked to those um, operating system disks. The identity disks are attached to the virtual machines then the virtual machines are managed and stopped so that you're not billed based on uh, four machines that are running, idle machines in that case. So when users log in and ask for a desktop or a published app, then machine creation services will start the machines. And when they log off, it will stop the machines so as to manage any type of expenses that are taken uh, that take place during your processing okay on demand provisioning as i said only identity disks and NICs are created during uh, the startup so on demand in other words machine creation services keeps in its database all the settings all the identities and when you say i want to launch 10 machines or 20 machines, I've got 50 people logging in right now, then we can launch those machines, give them their own identity, give them uh, everything they need to process. And so that's how machine creation services works in Azure. The next steps on divan provisioning, the operating system disk created by the virtual machine is uh, leveraged and at launch time they're merged. The virtual machine created and linked the OS disks at the virtual machine launch time. The identity disk also is attached at launch time. Okay. And then provisioning tasks. Uh, when the v virtual machine is no longer needed, the virtual machine will be shut down. The OS disks uh, will be deleted at shutdown because they were read only, so we don't need to pay for storage. Uh, the identity disk and NIC are, uh, setups are retained for the next startup. And when that machine is asked for again, then we copy back in the base, run by merging that in with our uh, identity disk, which contains our networking information also. Okay, real quickly, I know that we're uh, running close to the end of our webinar today. Um, we have considerations for deploying VDAs, virtual delivery agents, or your processing space. Um, we need to look at these. Enterprise customers typically have an enterprise enrollment with Azure, which is the topmost resource in the hierarchy and is associated with one or more accounts. Now, you can have accounts in different zones or regions. You can have an America account, uh, um, a European account, um, and so on. Those accounts then have subscriptions. So you need, typically you need an enterprise account, which is the parent organization. Then you need separate accounts for each uh, zone. For consumers and customers without an enterprise, the, their, to their topmost account would be just an account in one of those geos. Subscriptions are associated with accounts and can be one or more subscriptions per account. Azure records billing information at the subscription level, but can be reflected all the way up to the agreement layer so that you can look at all of the uh, expenditures for all of your different accounts. Networking. Virtual networks are necessary to support communications between virtual machines. You can define subnets, custom IP addresses, DNS settings, security filtering, and load balancing. By using a VPN gateway or express route circuit, you can connect Azure virtual networks to your on-prem networks. Virtual networks to virtual networks VPN also can be used for communication between different Azure regions. Azure Virtual Network Services enables you to securely connect 
Azure resources to each of your locations. A virtual net is a representation of your own network in the cloud. A virtual net is a logical isolation of the Azure cloud dedicated to your subscription. You can also connect virtual nets to your on-prem network or other Azure regions, and it is a subscription base. Storage, you've got managed disks, you've got unmanaged disks. These are things that you need to consider. Standard storage accounts are good for blogs, table storage, queue storage file, but managed disks automatically scale. There's no storage limits supported as a tech preview um, in Citrix Cloud. Now it's fully supported and it allows Azure to manage your storage. <clears throat> you pay for only what you use and it expands on demand and is fully redundant. So storage is a key part of deploying virtual machines. Resource groups. Resource groups are used to group related items together as an administrative entity. So in Azure, you logically group, group related resources such as storage accounts, virtual networks, virtual machines, into resource groups. So you need to have resource groups in Azure. Availability sets. Now, an availability set <clears throat> is a configuration that allows you to guarantee that all of your virtual machines are not on the same hardware. A, a uh, availability set ensures that virtual machines running the same service are placed on different hardware clusters within the Azure environment. Each hardware cluster is divided into multiple updated domains and fault uh, supported domains. The number of fault domains varies based on the Azure data center. Most have three, uh, some have two, Availability sets are what you need to understand in order to provide uh, redundancy, full redundancy within your Azure deployment. So these are all considerations. Uh, you need to consider what type of machine you're going to put in. General purpose machines, you've got the DV2, DVS, DVAV2, number of those. Under the machine that you choose, the deployment you choose, needs to be a balance between CPU and memory. Um, a machine may be small for testing purposes, but then in deployment, we may want to add additional resources. And so you need to have uh, the compute optimized, the memory optimized, the storage optimized, whether or not you need uh, a GPU, um, graphical processing unit high performance, you need to understand what type of load your application, your data, and your users will place on these machines and then match the machine size to the requirements that you have. And then network security. Security is a huge component. A network security group contains a list of security rules that allow or deny network traffic to resources connected to Azure virtual networks. Now, a network security group can be associated with virtual machines. It can be associated with individual network interfaces if you're using the Azure Remote Manager. Or it can be associated with subnets. So when a uh, network security group is associated to a subnet, the rules apply to all resources connected to the subnet. Traffic can further be restricted by also associating an NSG to a virtual machine or to a specific NIC. Templates. Templates can be used with both uh, ARM or PowerShell, can be used to create a single virtual machine or whole environments. Templates are based on JSON. Templates can be exported from ARM. Templates can be shared among accounts and subscriptions. GitHub is a great way to get familiar with templates. So we have templates as your automation. Automation can be used to configure repetitive processes. Runbooks can be created in PowerShell or graphical editor in ARM. 
Desired state configuration is a PowerShell component. Refer to the Runbook Gallery for templates. And guys, that's the executive briefing. That's what the webinar is all about. So what we talked about is Citrix virtual apps and desktop deployment models. How to de deploy them on-prem, how to deploy them in Azure, how to master an image, how to prepare it, how to use machine creation services and considerations for deploying VDAs in Azure. Cost, security, access, and management. And uh, Karen? Hey, wonderful, Jeff. Uh, so we have a few more uh, questions. Okay. You bet. So, yeah. uh, so can we get uh, a trial version of Citrix Cloud? Uh, yes, yes, you can get a 30-day uh, trial version. Um, let me see, go up here. Okay, request a demo, request a trial right there. Okay, just click on the button, log in. Again, what you do is, is you go to Citrix Cloud. It's cloud.citrix.com. Sign mm -hmm. up and click on any one of these and you can get trials and you can see the buttons right there. So it's real easy to do, okay? Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Jeff. Uh, uh -huh. What are the benefits to keep NetScalar and Storefront in cloud, or it is better to keep uh, both components in on-prem? Okay. Um, the, the, the product now, the Citrix ADC, which used to be called the NetScaler, we know that the NetScaler can be used for a lot of different functions, okay? If you're using the NetScaler as a uh, load balancer for on-prem um, deployments, when you move that to the cloud, then you're going to, you can continue to use the load balancing like GSLB and some of the other components with the on-prem component. But moving the gateway services up to the NetScaler Gateway or the Citrix Gateway in the cloud is probably your best bet. So we may move some of the functionality to the cloud, but then keep some of our high-end uh, load balancing, content redirection, uh, uh, call-outs, uh, redaction, all of the, the, the things that we do typically on-prem. We might want to keep that on-prem because uh, our administrators manage that, whereas the gateway component is managed by Citrix. Now, we have a console in the cloud that we can do some management with it, but most of the time what we do is we ask for a service and we tell it where the processing is and where the users are coming from, and Citrix manages all the rest. So I would say the gateway, let the cloud take care of that, but any type of load balancing or uh, uh, high-end functions of the NetScaler or Citrix ADC, I would keep it on-prem. Go ahead. Okay, great, Jeff. Uh, uh, last question. Uh, which uh, disk Cit Citrix recommends, managed disk or unmanaged disk? Oh, good question. Um, machine creation services, when it was first introduced, and provisioning services, only worked with standard disks, but now they both work with managed disks. And managed disks really are the way to go because even though there's a little bit more cost per the amount of storage, you don't have to declare the whole storage size. It will automatically grow for you. Um, so it's in the long run, you end up paying for only what you use. So the managed disks are a better deal. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Jeff, uh, there are see a lot of questions flowing in. I will take one more question, Jeff, if you don't mind. What I should we uh, consider from network perspective to avoid slowness when uh, your Citrix infrastructure is on Citrix Cloud or Azure and VDS are on-prem? Oh, let's, uh, that's a lot. <laughs> um, which question was that? So uh, this question uh, is from, uh, so from last uh, third one, uh, from Abhijit Roth. 
I'm trying to read it. <laughs> Can, mm, let's see. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. What should be considered from the network perspective to avoid slowness when your Citrix infrastructure is on Citrix Cloud and VDAs are on-prem? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Citrix has a component called the SD-WAN. The SD-WAN is a appliance. It is a physical device or a virtual machine that can be used to optimize connectivity and networks. It has built into it a super robust engine that can do compression and data deduplication. It can uh, leverage multiple paths, multiple routes, multiple networks in order to aggregate the uh, available uh, bandwidth into a single pipe. Um, the SD-WAN is definitely a component that needs to be considered uh, when you have concerns about um, speed, about connectivity, about productivity, the SD-WAN is the solution that you would use for that. Okay. Uh, Jeff, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, my uh, apology to all uh, attendees. Uh, see, I cannot be taking uh, more questions with positive of time. So I have I have to spend another this one few minutes uh, just to run through uh, the education pro product portfolio and the schedules and whom you need to get in touch with if you want to get trained on uh, CXT 252 and get certified. Okay, so let me make myself presenter. <coughs> okay, great. Uh, I suppose you see uh, my screen. Okay, yes. so this uh, yeah this webinar uh, as an event. Uh, we have organized with one of our associate and uh, partner, Citrix Authorized Learning Center, SSDN. So, yeah. So, if you see <coughs> Citrix product portfolio as such, so we have three uh, major product portfolio. We have virtualization, under virtualization, we have uh, application virtualization, desktop virtualization, and server virtualization. And the second portfolio is uh, networking, where we have Netscalar and SD-WAN. And last but not the least is uh, mobility. OK, so uh, when it comes to education, we cut across all this product portfolio. And here on the screen, you can see uh, uh, with uh, for networking, we have following courses. OK, share file, we have a course. And yes, workspace is something which is uh, a big buzzword uh, at Citrix. So we do have introduced uh, a course on workspace. And coming to this one already, that the cloud course, it is here. You can see CXT250, CXT251, and CXT252. These are the three courses <coughs> which are associated with the cloud. OK, so let me move to the next slide. Okay, so in terms of uh, delivery methods, so you can have either uh, the classroom training. When I say classroom training, you get into a classroom, trainer uh, get into the classroom, and uh, you guys are locked for 40 hours or five days, and the training is delivered through this one only that labs. <coughs> and in uh, virtual instructor-led training or live online training, okay, so a trainer will uh, log in remotely and you can log in at your place. So what we are doing is uh, the live uh, online session as such. <coughs> Apart from that, we also have a private training if an enterprise or if a corporate wish to send a group of people or if they want a group of people to be trained at their premises, we can definitely look for uh, such trainings also. Okay, so there will be a huge cost difference. When I say cost difference, the cost difference is somewhere between 20 to 40 percent. It depends on the part, the course and the duration. Let me go to next slide. Okay, <laughs> in terms of uh, certification, yeah. Under this one, what is that all product portfolio? We do have three tracks associate, professional, and experts. So, after completion of training on fourth day of the training, okay, so we send you, you uh, a 12 month validity exam voucher. You can go to any nearest Pearson Center and appear for the exam. Once you appear the appear for the exam, you get the immediate, immediately you get this course sheet, and maybe after a week's time, in a week's time or max in a couple of weeks, you'll get your batch. 
so these are the few upcoming uh, schedules for SSDN. Okay, so you can just have a look at uh, the schedules. If you wish to this one order that enroll, okay, so please uh, get in touch with us. Okay, so there are course on workspace, there are course on networking. Yes, uh, the, the cloud course is also there, 6252. So it is starting on 24th June. If you guys are interested, please do let us know. So whom to contact, whom you should get in touch, uh, touch to have the training details, cost, uh, and the schedule. Okay, again, I said here we have two types of uh, delivery methods. One is classroom and another is virtual instructor-led training. Okay, so these are the uh, contact of people whom you can get in touch. Okay, so I'm sharing with you the contact number <coughs> and their names. Yeah, no need to worry. Uh, no need to worry. In case if you can't note down, we will going to send a follow up mail to all the participants. Okay, so you can get, you can reach out to us. Okay, and last but not the uh, least. Uh, okay, so this is a recorded session. Okay, so those who request for recorded session, we will going to send the link. So I'm going to edit this uh, recorded session and maybe I'll share with uh, our associate uh, by tomorrow evening or early next week. And you can uh, get in touch with them for uh, the complete recorded version. Okay, so I'm uh, done, uh, Jeff. If there are uh, more questions, so let me uh, look at the questions. If there are any more questions. Uh, Jeff, there is one question. Uh, that smart tool is getting decommissioned now. What is the new alternate coming in? Sorry, I was muted. Um, can you repeat that? So what is the alternative for smart tools? So it is uh, observed that smart tool will get decommissioned in month of uh, June. So what is next after this? Uh, let's see. Um, should I repeat it? Where, what, yeah, what? what um, smart tools yeah. are getting discontinued. Smart scale, smart check, smart build. The smart tools, yes. Okay, they're being discontinued, but they are being the reason they're being discontinued is because they're being translated into the uh, studio console, the management console. Okay, so even though they're being discontinued, they're being wrapped up and inserted back into the uh, management console. So they're not a separate uh, a grouping at that point. Okay, the smart tools were used to to do analysis to assist in migrating uh, on-prem uh, VDAs to cloud VDAs, all of that. Uh, so they are being uh, moved, migrated into the console. Okay. Okay, that's good. Thank you so much. Thanks for time. Uh -huh. Okay, guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks uh, thanks a lot uh, for your time. Jeff, extremely uh, uh, thankful to you. Okay, so middle of the ni night, uh, you bothered to log in uh, and deliver this webinar. I understand, okay, it's 3 a.m. in the U.S. Thanks a lot. Okay, Parveen, uh, thanks for your time. Okay, so we will reach out to all the participants. We will send a mail. Okay, so please get in touch with uh, the uh, contact people here uh, to know more about uh, the course, course duration and the fees okay thanks once again thanks everyone thank you everyone